In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 1, we have the author writing these words. And again, I saw all the oppressions that are practiced under the sun. And behold, the tears of the oppressed, and they had no one to comfort them. On the side of their oppressors, there was power, and there was no one to comfort them. It's a fascinating verse because it speaks about the comfort that is lacking for both those who are oppressed and for those who are doing the oppressing. And it's an interesting thing when you think about it because we have a tendency to only think about the oppressed and not the oppressors. And I think Jesus himself lives this idea out. After all, he is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament, what was written about him in the law and the prophets in the writings was completely fulfilled in him. And so we should expect to see a passage like this being fulfilled in the life of Jesus. And in fact, we do in the passage we read earlier. And I do want to focus on that, but I don't think I can do it all in one message. So we're going to today focus on the first half of a story about Jesus who tra was traveling to Jericho. There's really two parts to this story, and it is in, found in Luke chapter 18 towards the end of the chapter, which we read from, but it continues on in Luke chapter 19. It's rather unfortunate that we have sometimes chapter divisions that cause us to stop in the middle of a narrative. Um, I don't know if you know this, but the chapters and verses were added to the Bible 400 years after it was written. In other words, for the first 400 years that after the Bible was written, there were no chapter and verse divisions. It was added by the Byzantines uh, later. And uh, it's helpful to have chapters and verses because it gives us a way to reference our Bible. We can find passages in the Bible fairly easily because we have these chapter and verse divisions. And, and most of the time, those chapter divisions seem to, be, seem to make sense. They seem to be in, in a good place. But here in this passage in Luke, I think we have an example of where it's in an unfortunate place because it causes us to stop at a point in the story where we need to keep going. And I'm taking advantage of that this morning because I'm going to stop there and finish the story next week. There's no way I can cover all this in one Sunday. But let me give you, some, let me give you the gist of the story. It's important to understand what's going on in the passage we read earlier. Jesus has been with his disciples in the Galilee area. And he has just spoken to them. He's told them that they're going to be traveling to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. But he's given them some information about what that's going to be like this time around. He says to them in verses 31 through 34 that the Son of Man... Uh, everything that's written through the prophets about the Son of Man is going to be fulfilled when they make this uh, trip. They're, he's going to be handed over to the Gentiles, it says, and he's going to be mocked, insulted, spit on, and they will flog him and kill him, and he will rise on the third day. He's just told them that before they take off on this journey. But the text tells us they didn't understand any of this. Why? Well, it's because they weren't expecting it. They were not expecting it. And a lot of times we don't understand something because we can't hear it. We're not expecting it. You know, this is why the Bible says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. It's saying, you need to understand this if you can. Because sometimes we hear things, but we don't get it. And this is an example of the disciples hearing something extremely important, but they don't understand it. They don't get it. And the, the story goes on and you see See how that plays itself out where uh, uh, Peter pulls out a sword in the garden. He tries to stop it. He says, this is not going to happen to you. You know all this. But they're traveling up to Jerusalem. And the way, there's two ways you could go. There's two ways you could travel. And a lot of the people that lived in the Galilee would, would make this journey 
every year for the Passover celebration. It's important to understand something about the Passover celebration. It was a celebration and it was a memorial celebration. It was a time that they remembered the freedom under Moses from the bondage in Egypt. Remember, this is what they celebrated. And it was a, it was a very celebratory time. There was a lot of feasting that took place. And it was a hurrah time. And that is contrasted, and this, by the way, took place in the spring. It was often contrasted with another important holiday that they celebrated back then called Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. That was a different kind of celebration. It was more of a somber remembrance. It's called the Day of Atonement. It was where, where they came together and they confessed their sins and sought forgiveness for their sins. Much more somber. For us as Christians today, we have a tendency to compress those into one thing. When we celebrate the Passover, which is what we do with communion, we are looking back at, at what has, the provision has been made for our sins. And so we don't see that distinction in the way that the Jews did. So the, the freedom from bondage, the freedom of, from the Im, imprisonment in Egypt that, that the Hebrews suffered under was an important celebration. And this is why they're headed to Jerusalem. Now, it's interesting because Jesus is making this route in the traditional way. The traditional way was that they follow the pathway that circled around Samaria. They, they followed a pathway that went down along the Jordan River and they would make their way up to Jericho, pass through Jericho in about 17 miles they would reach Jerusalem. They were intentionally going around Samaria and we know why that is the case. They didn't like the Samaritans. There are occasions when Jesus did go through Samaria and we have the story of Jesus meeting the woman at the well in that instance, which was a highly unusual thing. Uh, and we don't, we can't go there today, but anyway, Jesus makes his way uh, with his, with his uh, group and they are approaching Jericho. And so the text tells us that as he drew near Jericho, there was a man uh, sitting by the road begging. And it says here, hearing a crowd passing by hearing a crowd passing by. This is an important thing to keep in mind here because at this point in Jesus' ministry, he has become well known, okay? Uh, the, his notoriety has gone out. People know who he is. He has become famous in a sense. And um, so because they know he's coming, and this is, this is a practice that still exists today in the Middle East. When someone that's well known is approaching a town, there is usually an entourage that is sent out to meet that famous person, to welcome him into their city, welcome him into their town. And this crowd is more than likely a crowd that has been sent out to meet Jesus. And the more famous a person is, the greater the crowd will be and the farther that crowd will travel to meet the famous person, okay? They did this with famous rabbis. They did this with famous rulers. This was a common practice. Today, it would be equivalent to uh, if the Atlanta Falcons ever won the Super Bowl, to <laughs> there being a large crowd welcoming them home at the airport when they arrive after their victory. It would be somewhat equivalent to that. A large crowd goes out to welcome the sports team who is who has won, okay? That's perhaps a modern day equivalence to this idea. Jesus has been gathering large crowds around himself. We know the, the text tells us that on one occasion there were 4,000 people. On another occasion there were 5,000 people. These numbers aren't meant to give precise calculations but to show how popular he had become. He's, he's able to, to hold large crowds of people and hold their attention. And so as he's traveling along, excitement builds in Jericho because they are under siege by the Romans. There's high expectations about a Messiah who's going to deliver them from the bondage and it's Passover. What better time to go out and welcome this 
guy who's claiming to be the Messiah, the deliverer of Israel, hey, let's go welcome him. Let's, let's create a feast in our town. We'll bring him in here and we'll sit down. We'll have a chat all night with him and find out what's going on. After all, he's heading to Jerusalem for the Passover. Maybe this is the occasion. Maybe this is the time that the revolution will happen. You see, maybe he's got a plan to meet with the zealots in Jerusalem. The zealots were a sort of uh, rebellious group of people that were seeking you know, to, to have a, a military rebellion against the Romans. Maybe he's going to meet with the zealots and, and the plan is going to be put into action. After all, one of Jesus' disciples was a member of that group. His name was Simon the Zealot. This was a revolutionary group that was plotting how they could throw off the Romans. And so maybe we can sit down and find out what his plan is. So they send this entourage out there to meet Jesus and to welcome him in. But while this crowd passes by, there's a beggar sitting along the road. And he hears the commotion. And he says, what's going on? What does all this mean? So we know it's a commotion. It's a big crowd. What's all this mean? And they say, Jesus the Nazarene is passing by. Jesus the Nazarene is passing by. Now, he knows who this is. Word has gotten around. He knows that this Jesus has been healing people. He knows that this Jesus has had mercy on people. You see. And what does he say? It says here in verse 38, he called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, that's a very curious phrase, son of David, because the only other place we have someone referring to Jesus in that way is the Syrophoenician woman in another passage. It's interesting that he says, son of David. What do you think that communicates? It fits with what we've been already discussing. Maybe this is the son of David, the deliverer of Israel, the prophesied one. You see, he's been having mercy on all kinds of people. I've been hearing about this. People have told me as they pass by, maybe he'll have mercy on me. So he calls out, have mercy on me. But what happens? It says, then those in front told him to keep quiet. That's a very polite translation. They are really telling him to shut up and sit down and stay out of this. That's what the Greek suggests. Would you just shut up? This has nothing to do with you. Just stay over there and keep out of this. That's what they're saying to him. What are they doing to him? They're oppressing the oppressed. This man is oppressed. And they are the oppressors in this particular story. Does he listen to them? No, it says he cries out all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stops, verse 40. And notice what he does. It doesn't say that Jesus stops and then walks over to him. This is fascinating. It says he stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. What's Jesus doing? This is, this is pretty interesting here. Jesus is telling the oppressors to serve this man. He's telling them, bring him to me. Bring him to the king. Now you serve the king. He's telling the oppressors to bring the oppressed to the king. See that? When he drew near, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Isn't that a strange question? Shouldn't it be obvious what this man wants? I mean, he's blind, right? Why does Jesus ask him such a silly sounding question? Well, it's not silly at all if you understand the role of beggars in the Middle East. Uh, I, I traveled to Honduras some years ago, and uh, I remember the streets were lined with beggars. I, I remember walking down the street with my cousin in the capital city of Tegucigalpa. 
and a beggar approached us. He walked up to us with his hand out. My instinct was to pull out some money and give to him, which I did. He took the money, walked away. And I remember turning around and looking and I saw him sort of counting it and putting it into his pocket and he just wandered off. And my cousin said to me, don't do that again. <laughs> Why? The guy's a beggar. He needs money. He says, you don't understand how it works here. He said, these beggars are part of an enterprise, a corporation of sorts. They work together and there's, for lack of a better word, a pimp uh, who controls this particular city block. And they have to bring all the money that they make that day to him and he takes the vast majority of it and gives them a small percentage. This is how it works. It's an occupation. Now, it doesn't quite work that way in the Middle East, but it's similar. Begging was an occupation in the Middle East. It still is to this day. You can see beggars on the streets in different countries in the Middle East today. But you need to understand how it works to appreciate why Jesus asks him this question. Because it was, in fact, it is, in fact, an occupation in the Middle East. It was back in Jesus' day. But to be a beggar, you had to qualify for the position. You had to look like you were in need. Okay? So let's say you were lacking an arm. You were missing an arm. Would you qualify? Maybe. Maybe. Not necessarily. What if you were a one-legged person? Would you qualify? You'd have a better chance. What if you were blind? You're a shoe in Okay, that's, that's a guaranteed life occupation. You, you're going to have a business now as a beggar as a result of that. But it doesn't work the way we tend to think it does. For example, I was uh, down in uh, Lithonia with my colleague, Rusty Rickardson, and we stopped at the Crystal to get a breakfast one morning. There was a man standing outside, a homeless man, and he was begging. He was asking for money. He specifically asked, could you give me something so I could get something to eat? I took him inside and bought him a meal. But notice how he put it. Can you, get, can you give me some money so I can buy something for myself, something to eat? It's not how it worked in the Middle East. It's not how it worked at all over there. Why? Because the occupation of begging was connected with a religious obligation that everybody had. See, everybody was pious. Everybody had religious responsibilities. Uh, it was a part of their responsibility to give alms to the poor. Okay? Giving alms to the poor was a religious practice that everybody had to be engaged in. And so there was going to be a need for beggars to do this, to stand out and beg. But when a beggar asked for alms, he did not say, can you give me a couple shekels so I can buy a piece of bread. That's not what they would ever say. They would say, give to God. Give to God. Will you give to God? You see, because in the Middle Eastern culture, giving to a beggar is a religious practice in which you are serving God. Okay? And so, understood from that perspective, we can begin to see why Jesus might ask this question. Because this man has an occupation. This occupation is the only occupation he knows. You see. If he should lose his occupation, what is he going to do? You see, he has no education. He has no skills. He has no experience in anything else. He has no resume. If he is healed, if he loses his occupation, what's he going to do? Now, there's an interesting story I was reading uh, as I was preparing for this. Kenneth Bailey, who lived in the Middle East for 47 years, told the story about one of his students who became a missionary in India. And when he went to India, he found these beggars, a, a, a family of them, siblings that had been burnt in a fire when they were really young and they had scar, severe scar tissue on their legs and they were unable to walk. And so they had resorted to begging. This was what they did for a living. And he went and talked to some surgeons in a local hospital and he discovered that their 
that their legs could be surgically repaired so that they could walk again. So thinking that he was going to be able to offer them something and he was willing to pay for this. He went to these beggars and he said, I found a doctor who's willing to perform a surgery on you and he can fix your legs so that you can walk again. You won't have to do this anymore. He offered this to them for free. Every single one of them turned him down. Every one of them. And this might be hard for us to imagine, but you have to kind of put yourself into this position and think about this. This is the, we're making a good living here. This is what we know. We've done this for all of our lives. We can't do anything else. You see, what else would we do? And so it is a natural question in that environment to ask. When Jesus asks him, what do you want me to do for you? Now you can begin to see that it's not a stupid question. It's a legitimate question. He says, Lord, I want to see. I want to see. Immediately, Jesus says to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Instantly he could see, and he began to follow him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, they gave praise to God. What has happened in the story? These, the crowd was oppressing this beggar. They were oppressing him. Jesus began to turn the tables on them. What he did was he turned the oppressors around and they began to serve this beggar and the result of that was they saw this man express faith in the messiah who then healed him the result of this this was that they saw what he had done and gave glory to god they then became a part of the praise that went up along with the beggar because now he could see but it's interesting when we think about this, because in the, in the light of the context here, this is the first of two costly demonstrations of unexpected love that Jesus is going to perform. Now, think about that phrase, costly demonstration of unexpected love. Everything Jesus does is going to flow out of those ideas. Each word represents something costly. Who is it going to cost in this situation? In this particular instance, it's going to cost this beggar something. Remember what I said? He has no occupation. He has no resume. You see, it's going to cost him something. Remember what Jesus said about discipleship. It is true that grace is free, but Jesus also says this paradoxically. He says, if you want to come after me, it's going to cost you something. You see, Full devotion, full discipleship is costly. Despite the fact that we enter into that grace freely, to be a follower of Jesus, to truly be a follower of Jesus, it is costly. And in this particular instance, this man is costing him in the sense that now he has to find another occupation Right? He's no longer going to be able to beg anymore. Nobody's going to give him any money now. No alms are going to this guy. You see, but he's willing to be a follower of Jesus despite that. His faith is evidence in the willingness to accept the cost. You see. And because of that, Jesus says, Your faith has healed you. Your faith has healed you. It's costly. But there's also a demonstration here, a demonstration of unexpected love. Nobody was expecting Jesus to stop and talk to a beggar. Why would he do that? But he does do it. It's a demonstration as well. You see, it's one thing to say words about your love to other people. It's quite another thing to demonstrate that. Saying words is not enough. Saying, as James says, 
God bless you. May you be filled. Without works, it's dead. Right? Demonstration is necessary. Unexpected in love. This is what the world needs to see from us, folks. It needs to see the unexpected demonstration of costly love. That's what the world needs to see from us. That's what the world saw with Jesus. In the next episode of this ongoing story in chapter 19 that we'll be looking at next week, we're going to see the costly demonstration of unexpected love that Jesus exhibits towards someone else. His name is Zacchaeus, who is an oppressor in the minds of people. And this is where it costs Jesus a good deal. So in this particular lesson this morning, we see that this blind man's faith is detectable in the fact that he has faith to believe that Jesus has the power to heal him. He also believes that Jesus has compassion on the poor. I mean, this is a teaching throughout the Bible. If you remember the story, if you remember the response that Mary gives in Luke chapter 1, when she finds out that she's going to be the mother of Jesus, the mother of the Messiah, what does she say? We have that beautiful prayer that she utters called the Magnificat. You know that. You know that passage. And one of the things that she utters is this. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and the rich he has sent empty away. You know, this idea of salvation coming for the poor and the oppressed being delivered. Here we see that in this exhibited in this story about the blind man. But what about Ecclesiastes 4? Here's the comfort that's given. Here's the comfort that's given. Jesus comes to give that comfort to the oppressed. What about the oppressors? Ecclesiastes talks about this need for comfort. Where's the comfort for the oppressed? Jesus comes to do that too. And this is probably what is most shocking. This is probably even more shocking than Jesus' Jesus' willingness to talk to this beggar. And this is what we'll see next week. So, what is the lesson for today? The lesson that we need to carry forward is the lesson of recognizing how we need to continue to serve even when it's costly to us. Serving one another in acts of demonstrated costly love. Demonstrating it to one another. When the world sees that, then what was Jesus' desire to be said of his followers will be said of us. How will people know that you are my disciples? If you say you have love for one another or if you actually have it in terms of what you do for one another. That's what it means to be a follower of Christ. And it's costly to us to do that. We, it's costly to us at the outset anyway, but once we get engaged in it, we begin to see the joy that comes in that. And that, my friends, is where the comfort comes to us. A lot of people, a lot of people today, I see it on Facebook, people that I know, I see it in the world around us, a lot of people are miserable. They live miserable lives. And I'm convinced that the reason they're so miserable is because the only person that they think about is themselves. That's why. Where do you find real joy? Where do you find real comfort? When you quit thinking about yourself and you start thinking about other people and you start serving them. It doesn't make sense to the world that it should be this way, but it makes sense to us because we know it and we experience it. When we set our own interests aside and put the interests of others above our own, all of a sudden we discover true joy. Why? Because in that instance, we're acting like God acts and we were made in his image and we were made for him. May we go from here today remembering that and putting into practice the thing for which we were made to be like Jesus.